Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Super Soldier Talk. Today is April 10th, 2023. So here we are, 2023, and we still haven't got our full disclosure yet, but you know, there's lots of work to do, and that's why we, ha we have Rebecca Rose here to share her uh, amazing story of being a experiencer, a, a multi-dimensional galactic experiencer in the Secret Space Program. And thank you all the listeners also for coming on here today. I know this is short notice. Uh, we, we, we had plans of having this all scheduled and hashed out a couple of days ago, but because of Easter and all that, everything got set back. But it doesn't matter. We're going to have a great show to hear today. All right. And thank you also, Rebecca, for coming on here. How are you doing today? Hey, it's awesome to see you. We haven't done an interview since uh, 2020. So it's great to be here and, and to have actually met at the, the grafting conference last year was even better. Mm -hmm. So. Good to be here. Yeah. Uh, so that is uh, coming up this year in April. Uh, I think it's 20, 22 to 25th. I think. Uh, so go check the, the more des the description section of that of this video. It's the Journey to Truth conference in Grafton, Illinois. And uh, go get yourself a ticket. The, uh, the hotel is actually sold out, but there's still rooms for still room for uh, purchasing a ticket for this conference and also probably a meal plan there, too. So. Um, Okay, great. And uh, let's uh, let's go ahead and I'll start with reading out your bio. So Rebecca Rose is a multidimensional galactic experiencer cur currently serving the collective with her work as an intuitive seer and channel. As a lifelong contactee, she was originally targeted for her desirable psychic attributes. She was taken to work in a multiple a multitude of dark programs from her earliest years, a path that was facilitated by her family work members working in the deep state. In her last interview, she she mentioned that her father worked for Lockheed. And uh, yeah, so after abductions to, uh, to work, I guess she worked for the Germans on the moon, she was sent to Montauk and survived. Today, we're also going to be going to some of that Montauk timeline. Further, my lab experiences landed her on Mars, where she, she was engineered as a cyborg and weaponized for uh, Mars Defense Force. She was trained as a pilot, a killer, Cloned many times, she was eventually sold to the Draco Empire. In the outer reaches of the solar system beyond the Kupier Belt, she was tasked with patrolling a galactic slave trade hub, command commandeered, command com, is that, is that saying that commandeered, command, commandered by the Draco and protecting a significant planetary portal on Planet X. I guess that's under uh, the Merchant Marine Fleet. She can explain more about that in just a bit. But as an adult recovering from years of dehumanizing SSP involvement. Uh, Rebecca credits her strong meditation practice as her main healing ally. Trained in the ancient spiritual traditions of Tibet, Rebecca engages in silent sitting practices and energy, inner energy work that have assisted the return of her memory and putting pieces of her life back together. She also does these sessions for other people. And we're going to go that just a, just a bit. But from the vantage point of the soul and the perspective of deep healing, Rebecca says, I came here for this. I came here here for this. I know I came to explore the deepest, darkest, and most savage belly of the beast so that I could experience it firsthand and be part of its undoing. Rebecca also has a vast array of helpers from many different realms assisting her. Her light family includes a Nordic mate from Procyon, an indigenous mother and father from a previous lifetime with the Crow people. And through her own experience and continual work with higher energies, she's been giving the resources given the resources to assist others in recovering from their own most mm -hmm. horrifying experiences, bring light to darkness. So uh, visit Rebecca's website at Rebecca Rose Barfoot, Barfoot .com. And so you can also sign up for a session. Apparently, I guess you're booked to July now. I'm booked almost into July, but I'm available. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, James. Yeah. Good to be here. Like I yeah, said. Thank you for coming on here today. So mm -hmm. uh, I guess, Going back to the galactic slave trade, was that actually Merchant Marine Fleet that you were with, or is this something entirely else different? I've never had it come back to me in my memories as a Merchant Marine Fleet per se. No, I was, I was. We can talk about this. Um, in the moon, in the the German base on the moon was at that time. This is this is back in the seventies. I'm I'm fifty now, so <laughs> this is a long time ago. But at the time, it was a slave trade hub, and as as was the Planet X and the Kuiper Belt, where I was owned by the Draco. It's, it's also the same thing. So, yeah. Well, how about, so, you know, in our last interview, uh, we were, it was a little more informal. We were just having more of a discussion, but this time I'd like to let, allow you to speak more 
But um, maybe could you could you tell us a little bit about maybe the galactic slave trade? Maybe you could describe some of the slave markets if you've ever been to one. What what it's like? How they? I don't know. I want to start with that. Okay, we're just diving into that. Well, yeah. So my my familiarity familiarity with the uh, slave trade. Um, I think we could talk about it as part of my mission. Like I came here to explore. I have a higher avatar on a on a galactic ship. You know, in in. I guess the tandem time, right? And from from that avatar, I created here, incarnated here, to in fact to learn more about the slave trade. We wanted to understand more about what was going on within the bowels of that. And again, a, a long time ago, I think a lot of that has dissipated, um, and things are not as degraded and depraved as they were at that particular time, the 70s and 80s. Um, but my familiarity, like I said, is from working in the German base when I was little, um, and and working directly as a psychic operative with beings they had in captivity there. Um, and they were making clones, um, experimental beings, and um, a lot of different hybrid type of beings. So humans were involved in the slave trade, trading with, with human hybrids and human DNA, but also ET type beings, um, beings I couldn't even have any names for that were uh, captive to the Germans at that time, and also the connection to Dulce as well. So it, it, I didn't have a need to know or need to be at, a, at in the market or the trade process or at, at uh, you know, a bartering uh, and negotiating table, you know, so to speak. I was little, I was a kid, I was just, I was under their influence, I was operated um, by them, but I, I would not have had this, the status to really know the inside of all of that in, in this, maybe in the way you're thinking of. Yeah. Well, maybe you could, could you describe a little bit more about the mechanics, but I mean, the, uh, the reasons why they're, uh, the trade itself, yeah. so, uh, for instance. Yeah, 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 sure. They're trading, sure. Weapons, they're trading well, us. We are the product. They're trading what, us. What, what are they getting in return? Right. So go ahead. Right. And yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all, we, I mean, you've talked about this probably a thousand times on this channel. <laughs> DNA is the currency of everything. DNA technology, but, but through beings, I mean, I, when I was on the moon, I was, you know, the Germans, the Greys, and the Draco were there. I was mostly interfacing with the, the Draco um, uh, to get my orders and to be trained by the Draco. And the Draco always seemed like they were the honchos of everything going on. Where the, wherever the Draco are present, I have found that they are the top dog. That's, that's it. And they were building an empire, you know, I think also involving um, like adrenochrome back in the day. This is again, a long time ago, but um, making the Draco rich was one of the things that was going on. That that's what I saw. I mean, just speaking from my own experience, like what is the point of this, you know, trading, trading humans, human parts, human endocrine system secretions. Um, and like I said, the, the clones and the hybrids and all of that. Um, to other races, and I don't, I don't know if I can fully unpack that. I mean, off world, out of the solar system, off, I mean, way beyond what the human mind can fathom. You know, when I was owned by the Draco out on Planet X, that hub was, I don't have human language to describe how big it was, how powerful it was, and how much was going on there, um, which was why they needed so many assets to protect their investment um, in that whole market. So, um, on the moon, I guess we could talk about the moon, my job on the moon. I mean, I was four years old when I was initiated into all of this by the Draco and, and they took me to the moon back and forth from my, I was, I was uh, raised in New Hampshire um, and they brought me back and forth, back and forth at night. And it, this was not the start of the 20 and back. So this seemed more to be of a, I would say an experimental program. Um, and I think they were getting my body adjusted to something, my biology um, adjusted so I could later work the, the Dulce jump gate that connected the moon and Dulce. But like I said, my they, they kind of broke me in slowly there, um, using me to psychically interface with, with, with the beings that they had in captivity. And I was supposed to be stealing their information, or we could say taking a snapshot of their DNA and their biological markers and um, dimensional, how would we say, like their dimensional, their unique dimensional stamp or timestamp, we could say, and taking all that information through, through my awareness, my consciousness, and relaying it to a central database. But I always felt like with them, I was meant to befriend the beings, but also to betray them. And it's a mark that's still in me, like this is a kind of programming to, um, it's like the, the victim perpetrator programming, the aversion 
I, as the victim was, was feeling like I was the perpetrator, like doing bad things. And you know, this, that they, that's a, that's one of the main programs that they're, they're instilling in us mind control programs that the victim will always blame themselves and never get out of what's been done to them. So I always felt really bad, even as a little four or five, six year old kid, what, what was happening and, and going in there and befriending these beings that were in captivity for all these dark processes um, that they were, the Germans and the Draco and the Greys were doing to them and then turning against them, like to be made to befriend them and then, like, yeah, absolutely to betray them. So over time, um, how do I say this? In my early time of talking, maybe in the, the interview that you and I had a few years ago, like I didn't know that I was being sent to Dulce. And I would describe like these cages and this dim light and this orange glow and the stench and the filth and the feeling of being in hell realm. As I described it as like, this sounds a lot like what I've heard coming out of Dulce, New Mexico, but I didn't know that that was actually what I was describing because the, the, the process of going through that jump gate felt so seamless in a way from the moon, the German base on the moon into Dulce. It was like going, it felt to me as it comes through my memory, it was like going into, you know, the next room of my home. Um, I'm sure it must have been a little more complex than that, but to my child's mind, a child drugged and, and controlled in a certain way, like. I didn't know the difference. And so that came to me, those memories came to me in the time after you and I last spoke. And it explained a lot to me about the memories I was having and the the the, the breadth and depth of of that of Dulce was something that you could wander around in there forever down in that I call the dungeon and never know the beginning and the end of what was happening down there with the Greys. And I never saw humans other than human captors. They wanted the tunnel, the cargo from the tunnel, the supply, human supply from the tunnels, right? Um, but I never saw humans in charge. They might have been on the upper levels. Um, but but the memories there are pretty, I mean, it's, it's dark and it's disturbing. And I just remember a smell and keeping my, my kind of face averted. Um, so do you have any, you want any clarifications up to that point, James? Yeah, you got to explain. Uh, tell us, tell us how old old you were and why why were you at Dulce right yeah I I was a little older so they started taking me to the my first objections were to go to be with the Germans and the Draco on the moon um and the Dulce started later it was probably around let's see seven seven eight seven eight around that time period um six seven eight um <clears throat> and it was they wanted the child's frequency so you know, in my understanding, and just a sort of soundbite on how, how does a, this is oversimplifying, but I would say, how does a jump gate work? It's compressing space and time. But if, the, if, if a certain frequency range isn't maintained for the gate, uh, you can lose, they could lose cargo, you know, precious cargo, let's say, uh, in inter, interdimensional space, right? So they need a, they need, and because it's so dense, like the, it's very degraded what they're bringing up to the moon to be traded off world. From Dulce, right? And they need a child's, I want to say like an innocence frequency to help maintain a certain, um, like a frequency range within the gate so it'll operate properly and nothing will get lost. And, and like I said, I touched on this just briefly that um, it seemed to me that I didn't understand a lot for a long time. Why were they taking me back and forth to the moon from my, my home, you know, abducting me at night um, over the years? I, I, I think it was to train my biology to to, because I was going in a ship, I would go into a, um, a substation to get to the moon. And it, it can be hard on the body. I mean, human biology is not, cellular biology is not meant to be, um, it's, it's meant for Terra, it's meant for Earth, right? But I think all of those back and forth trips to the moon were training me, my biology to withstand the rigors of, of going back and forth and back and forth through that gate. Again, it's gonna be hard on it. It'd be extremely hard on an adult biology, but I think because children are so, they're still porous. If you think about a small child, they're not, when I look at it psychically, their, their um, energetics are not entirely wed with their biology. They're not entirely formed yet. And so it's, I don't wanna say quite that it's easier on a child's physiology, but in effect, relative to an adult, body, it would be a little bit easier and a child could withstand that back and forth, back and forth. So I was basically an escort for cargo is a pretty sterilized word. I mean, bodies, body parts, hybrids, clones, and so on that were coming up from Dulce. Um, 
Yeah, does that make sense, James? Yeah, we got lots of questions. Let's start with, uh, did you ever uh, witness Nightmare Hall? And uh, maybe you can also describe if you saw any aliens down there in Dulce. Mm. I just remember, I remember the greys and then I remember beings that seem to be, I don't know anything about Nightmare Hall. I don't know what that is. The whole thing felt like fucking Nightmare Hall. I mean, the whole thing was one big nightmare. Um, but it sounds like that's a specific location in, in the lower reaches of Dulce. Is that correct? Yeah. Was it uh, Cost was Thomas Costello, I think, described it. Uh, yeah, the different cages in there and with yeah. the... The, what they call chimeras, the hybrid creatures. And yes, they had. People. Yes. So I don't know a name that's called Nightmare Hall, but yes, absolutely. hundred percent. There were animals down there that feel, felt like, I don't know, they came from inner earth or something. There were uh, th things I cannot name. I do not have linear English words to describe. I remember a lot of light, light beings, light emanating from the cages and beings that seemed extremely upper dimensional. I do not know how they, they co-opted them for the purpose of, you know, what they were doing with all these experiments in the lab. I don't know how they got them down there. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe this is congruent with his description of Nightmare Hall. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, um, what about different types of aliens? Did you witness greys, reptilians? Greys. And I, I never saw reptilians down in Dulce. I never saw, it. that was the domain, a hundred percent of the greys. 100% of the greys. And I know they were, I mean, they were, there were so many different experiments going on and, and, and so much of, you know, them, part of that was them trying to, you know, save their own wrecked biology, their own savage DNA, because they'd experimented on themselves. They'd been experimented on by others. And, you know, they were in a degraded biological state in many ways with their own genetics, but, but there was also trade in human, human body parts. And like I said, human, they were very interested in the human endocrine system and the secretions from those glands. Uh, that was a byproduct going, going off world, going off of earth. And I think out of the solar system, yeah. um, I, I don't know exactly what all races are most interested in the human glandular, uh, system, but I I'm going to share a, I think it's a five second clip. So um, if you have any kids here, you may not want to look. This is a chimera. I think, I don't know if it's down in Dulce, but I was told that this is authentic video. It's pretty creepy, but um, we're, uh, I guess we, sometimes we do creepiness on here, if that's okay. okay. Go so, for it, James. Yeah. Okay. Here's our, 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 our friend over. Oh, it's on two seconds. So, so yeah, they got, they're creating all these, these type of creatures down there. So this, this apparently is real. Um, yeah, so this we've got a huge problem here on this planet where humans are being abducted and converted, not only to slaves, but these these creatures and sold off to okay. Yeah, it's pretty unfortunate. Well, so I guess on a on a on a higher note, I could say that when I look at Dulce Lab now, like in our current time, it looks empty. When I look at it psychically and I keep doing this and going back and looking, did I get this right? And it feels like it's defunct. I don't know if that's information that's circulating around, if you've heard this from anywhere else. And it doesn't mean all of it has stopped, but I just say when I look at it, it Dulce in particular feels like things have moved on from there and gotten really quiet. Um, just my impression. So I thought I would add that. Oh, just, do you see a bunch of water down there flooded out? I don't see water. It just feels empty and I just smell, I smell residual smell psychically, but um, hmm. yeah. Okay. You know, and Dulce as well, uh, you know, I was shown this psychically so, a couple of years ago, is that if, if that it was built upon a, a benevolent portal uh, that would have been used by the Apache, the Native Americans, to commune with benevolent beings a long time ago, and the Greys got a hold of it. So, you know, is there an important piece of, of information there that that has gone back to higher hands as we're seeking to get out of this morass on this planet right now? That's a, potentially a hopeful note. Yeah. All right. All right. More questions about Dulce. Let's, how about you, could you describe uh, what does the portal room actually look like? And also, hold on, what does the portal look like? And is it modern or ancient? Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question. You know, so these <laughs> memories come through my child's mind and, you know, child remembers it as being just this, it feels just like air. It feels like space. It feels like I'm in this you know, my, my vision could see a room, but it actually feels 
through my body, my soma, my sentience, it feels like there's nothing around me, like I'm just moving through space. So that's not congruent with our linear 3D reality, right? Like to see one thing, but also to know that that's not what's actually going on, if that makes sense. So it's hard to describe it in linear terms. It's a nonlinear phenomenon, I would say. But it always, like I said, it always seemed very seamless. Like, And it didn't seem like there was a crazy, like, technological, like all these bells and whistles to the tech that was visible to me, at least in my memory as I understand it. Um, very seamless and very pared down. I mean, I'm sure Jumpgate technology has changed over time and depending on where, which group they got the tech from and so on and so forth, there's different iterations of, of Jumpgate tech. Um, would you, I mean, is that something you, you feel as well? That there could be different. Oh, oh yeah, it's certainly. Yeah. There's yeah, the jump rooms. You know, they look like yes. an elevator that curves around, according to Andrew Basaggio. But mm -hmm. uh, some people describe these portals. Um, um, we had this, uh, David Lotherington on here who channeled Dr. Michael Wolf, um, who was part of uh, Majestic, and he described yeah. what what he just said, just stated is that um, the port as you approach the portal, your hair would stick up because there's so much energy. Yeah, you change yeah. your vibration. Yeah, yeah. You remember yeah. that? Energy. Yeah, I feel I, rem I feel I remember those kinds of changes. Like the the that's exactly like you said that well. The the, the energetic changes and the 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 perception that I have that is multidimensional and, and not third density. That's what I remember. Those are the signatures of the jump room for me. Yeah. Um, well, what about um, traveling through the portal? Uh, does it damage? Well. If it damages your DNA, does it damage your DNA? If it does, um, why would it do it? And if yeah. you have information on that. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I My perception is that it can degrade cellular biology, like the molecular structure, the atomic molecular bonds and the atomic structure will be degraded. How does that speak to, is the DNA changed? I think over time, if you just did it and did it and did it, like if you use a regen tank over and over and over, it will fuck you up. Like it's, it's not, you can't keep doing that. I think the same is true with this particular technology. And I think they used a variety of children to, uh, you know, so they wouldn't just work one kid to death, you know, they'd have a, it switch them out and switch them out and switch them out. Um, it was, it seemed to be always children operating the gate. So did, uh, uh, did, did, did you require uh, being put into a med bed after going through the portal? I don't think so. And that's, that's, what's kind of weird. You would think, right? Like back and forth, back and forth. What the hell? I don't, I don't have memory of that. I don't, I don't think where they were invested enough in me to actually care to do that. But like I said too, is that why they were taking me back and forth to the moon in this very precise way over a number of years before they got me working on the jump gate to train the biology again. And all of this predicated on the fact that, you know, it was written into my life plan, let's say. You know, my, my own agency helped forge the life plan that I would eventually be sent to Mars in 82 for a 20 back. So this is all kind of prepping me biologically, psychologically, psychically, uh, and so on for a much bigger agenda later on in space. I think it all dovetails, you know, when I look at the big picture of this, I mean, it's pretty sophisticated from start to finish. Thank you. All right. Uh, what does it look like as you're traveling through the portal? Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It looks like not much, to be honest. <laughs> like it's so fast. It's not, to me, as I recall it, it's not even, there's not a lot going on. There's those multidimensional experience of, of, of change happening but I don't remember a visual of it. I just, and this is why, I mean, that's why that I didn't even know I was leaving the moon for Dulce because there wasn't a lot of signature of visual or, or you know, there wasn't so much to differentiate one place from the other, at least in my recall. So uh, sorry to disappoint everybody. <laughs> there was, wasn't a lot of, you know, it was a little bit um, casual, like almost too casual. Yeah. Um, that's and how, my experience. And how, I was also drugged. I mean, I was a kid that was drugged. I was abused and I was just looking at the ground, doing the job that they had programmed me to do. So, you know, it could be missing links in there that I'm not recalling. Go ahead. Well, how, how big is this portal and what color was it? And what did it actually look like when you looked at it? Yeah. And those are, that's, that's the thing. It's like, I'm just opening a door. It's like a, it's like just moving through a dark field. There was a darkness around it a gray, black kind of nondescript, you know, really. I mean, it wasn't, 
wasn't like this shimmering, you know, we might think of a, a portal as a shimmering light affect having a, a similar, you know, like a high level frequency attached to it. But I think this may have also been to, um, how do we say, like to disguise it. You know, we don't want to like announce what's going on here because the moon at the time too was, was supposed to be kind of a regulated space and having this connection to Dulce would have been, you know, was this a little bit rogue? Do they really want to announce that this is going on right here with a big, you know, neon explosion of, of hey, a jump gate is here. So I think that might have been why there wasn't so much visual um, uh, stimulus connected to all this. Hmm. So uh, before you step through the portal, it actually looked brown or black. It's like, okay. Yeah, gray black. And it looked gray like black. a door, like an regular It door. looks like almost like a shadow, like you're stepping into a shadow and then you're gone and you're opening hmm. through a, just through a corridor into Dulce. Okay. So yeah. once you got to Dulce, what, what happened to you then? What, what were they doing to you? Or if that's, the I was just going back and forth. That would kind of go in, they'd have something they wanted to load. I would step aside, let them, you know, put in this, this almost like a non-dimensional space. I mean, we could see it like as an elevator, a little sh a room or a shaft. I was just get out of the way and they would move cargo in and I would, a lot of times I was just looking at the ground, you know, that's how we dissociate and just disengage from what's happening. So there'd be, um, sometimes I was bringing data back, but usually it was beings, body parts, and like I said, endocrine system stuff, and, you know, just go back and go back and go back and go, go, go for, forth and back between those, those locations. I was, I recall being, you know, wandering around through those, um, through the maze of like cages, the beings in cages, um, and at times I was trying to go and just connect with these beings who seemed so interesting to me. Uh, that was not part of my job, but it was what I wanted to do. And to connect with them from a, um, a place of, of communion and heart and not from a place of I'm being abused and I'm helping abuse them and they're being abused, but something just trying to bring, I don't know, you know, a child's curiosity to connect with these unusual and, and somewhat beautiful beings. Um, there was that. Yeah. All right. Uh, were there other children around you as well being experimented in this way? There were, um, there were other kids, well, like I said, the other kids who were operating the jump, jump room and we were, it's weird. They didn't want us to connect. Like I can understand this. They didn't want us to bond. No human bonding is wanted to happen there. Um, so they would keep us apart from each other and there there were kids who were also serving other functions down in Dulce. Um, I don't know that I know all there is, you know, about that because I wasn't allowed to interact as much as I would have wanted. Um, but, you know, the ch children, I mean, we know this from the SSP. You know, they took me into the SSP formally when I was nine. The, the children are so useful because we're, we're so porous. We can do whatever they need. Adults can't do it because we're so conditioned in a certain direction. And we have those psychic abilities intact. So... I think that the children were also used to keep the beings who were captive kind of um, in a certain, certain frequency range, in a certain, you know, using them in, in a way to manipulate them and keep them um, in a certain mind state or in a certain mood or in a certain feeling. You know, the children could, could the child could um, make you happy, make you sad, light you up, um, augmenting the emotional state so to speak, of the beings. And that's that's a place for, uh, from which they would alter uh, or, or alter, make alterations in the DNA. Like they, we want the, when I was, when I was the child who was doing that and kind of getting their information, they wanted the beings in a certain frequency range. And in that certain fre frequency range, you know, say a friendliness, happiness, light, they can, certain things will light up in the, in the, DNA and the biology that they actually wanted to eliminate. So find out where those happy vibes are. I'm simplifying this too much, but find out where that is and let's delete that from the program. We don't want that. So let's get that out of there. They wanted, in many ways, they wanted to create beings who could do all the functions of, um, you know, have the higher dimensional capacities, but without sentience. We don't want all those messy um, emotional entanglements. We don't want you know, all the things that make us human or that make benevolent beings benevolent, they wanted to get that out of there. So I hope that makes some sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that actually maybe answers one of the other questions they had earlier is why, why you were involved. 
in this whole program. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah. And it's it's all we could talk it to you about like I hadn't gotten to the 20 and back yet. And this is helping instill a lot of distortions and inversions in my humanity. The victim, the swapping, I mentioned the swapping the victim perpetrator role. And we learn that betrayal, betrayal is the currency, right? Betray or be betrayed. That's what I'm learning here. Um, a lot of there's a lot of deviance inside all of that and also learning right that i will be mastered i am not my own uh i'm not autonomous i'm always looking to somebody else for guidance show me what to do tell me what i should do and um expecting to be manipulated expecting to be abused expecting to be drugged and so on and so forth this is priming me for everything else i'm going to experience at montauk and um, later on in mars so it's just getting at me early and continuing on. And this was this was light duty and this was light programming compared to the things that came later. So it was all a very precise progression over time and over the years. Okay. Um, I want you to continue on that just a bit, but let's finish uh, one last question here of Dulce. Uh, did you uh, connect with any of the beings down there that were in the cages and like what messages did they tell you? What, what did, if you remember what they look like, could you describe that as well? Yeah, I remember, well, I think I said this, uh, just an orange glow, like beings that seem like they had this peach colored glow and that they seem to be, they seem to be more made of light than, than substance. Um, I don't know how to describe that. I would, well, I could say it's like an upper dimensional quality, but I don't have names like, oh, these beings are from Sirius or they're from inner earth or, they're, you know, some of the animals seem to be from inner earth. I don't even know. I mean, they weren't all beings that had like a head, two arms, two legs, a star configuration. Some of them seem to be like not, I don't even know where they came from. Um, I remember exchanging not linear English messages, but this love in a place like that. I mean, it's so strange, right? It's so strange. Um, wow. Lit up with a kind of love. I mean, think about that. Yeah. So there's a, again, we're talking about energy and frequency and vibration and conveyance through that means rather than a message of, you know, take good care of yourself or please don't do this to me or whatever it might be. Um, and again, this is coming, I've said this before already, but, but, but it's coming through the mind of a child that's been myself, who's, you know, um, the memories come in a different way and they're not always so, so linearly oriented They're more, they have more emotional and multidimensional qualities to them because of what's, what's happening for me in the situation I'm in. Yeah. But that, that's a great question. Um, that's a great sure. question. I, th I think the nature of these, these memories too, is that more, more continues to unfold over time. But when all of you guys know this, who are, are retrieving memories from the programs, a lot of them are really hard and, and difficult and emotional. So um, I think there's a part of me that has put the brakes on recalling more from this place. Like, okay, I have enough. That's it. I don't want to know more in a way to be, to be really frank. Yeah. Well, do you have enough information to answer this question? Was there different races of children at Dulce? Ooh, that's a good question. I remember different races of children. You mean like ET children or I remember little white kids. Yeah. As in like, like gray, little gray, white, gray kids. <laughs> no, like the little Caucasian kids. Oh. But I think you mean like, did I see hybrids? There were also, um, there were hybrid gray human hybrids there i think that's what you're meaning yes yes in different stages of development some of the the lab experiments there was a, a section of of lab where some of the beings took a really long gestation um i don't know exactly what what was in all of those pod type things but some of them seem like they were growing so slowly it would take years for them to develop and those were a high prize you know um experiments or high prized creatures, high prized beings that they were getting out of that. Yeah. All right. And what about the smell? Patty is asking, what what did it smell like? Oh God, like death. It just smelled like death and and decay. I mean, to be you know honest, um, it'll really bad smell. Uh, that's the that's the closest approximation. I don't know if there's a because we're, we've got all the smell of the the things that are not even coming from Earth. I don't know if there's an earthly way to describe it's like beyond death, um, but but decay, decay and stench and filth and um, like a kind of a, a damp, a dampy smell in there, too. Yeah. And it was always dark. It was never I never saw 
No, it's always dimly lit. It's not like, oh, we put, come in and flick the lights on. No, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. Because I think also the light would bother uh, some of the experiments and the beings that they had cooking, so to speak. Um, you know, the greys don't like light environments. It's I think it's hard on their eyes. Yeah. Okay. Well, how about we go to the next question mm -hmm. or topic, I guess. Uh, how did you end in the, up in a 20 year and back program? Yeah. Oh, I always blame my father. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, largely because my father was working with the deep state military industrial complex and he was working in top secret with the naval intelligence. Um, he went into the top secret classified world when I was about three or four. I think prior to that, he'd only been uh, working with a secret clearance. Um, and it was all, I think it was through his own agency. You know, I had visions in meditation, deep meditation, several days in a row, um, back in 2020, 21, maybe of, of my father in a conference room with two grays guys in Navy uniforms and guys in suits. And they're pushing papers at him and they're saying, sign, you know, like sign this, this is, and they're saying, this is for the betterment of humanity, meaning myself. And I think also my, my brother was also in the programs. I don't, we had a tandem abduction experiences as kids, but he, Anyway, I think my father was probably signing away my brother as well. Um, <clears throat> you know, my mother's side of the my family had dark reptilian in her German bloodline and ritual abuse going back several generations into Germany. Um, so we have a dark reptilian on my mom's side, and we have my father, who is a Zeta hybrid, coming in being manipulated by his handlers within the military industrial complex and also by the Orion Group. So this is it's a I call it a my lab family breeding program. I mean. My parents met in the army in 65. It was a total setup. They got married in a month, not because my mother was pregnant, but because I think they were destined to create my lab babies. And when I look at it now, I mean, that's pretty sobering. I didn't want to look at that for a long time, but that's what I see. It's an absolutely perfect setup for that. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot, I mean, I could talk about my father for a long time, but that's kind of how I ended up being um, routed or, or uh, kind of how do we say down down a pipeline in the my lab pipeline the highway to my lab was all over my my years leading up to 82 when i was taken for the longer longer 20 and back so yeah okay um does your brother speak about his experiences to you <sighs> james we have some work to do on my brother <laughs> my brother thank you i mean he He's four years older. He spent his childhood reading sci-fi, drawing spaceships and aliens and, you know, all of that. And it only came out last fall because I was asking him point blank, like, what do you remember from, from happening to you at night when we were kids? It turns out he was having the same, like what I call night terrors. Like I'm mute, I'm paralyzed. They're coming and taking me. I feel I'm being elevated or uh, levitating out through the house or the wall or the ceiling. And he, just last year, it took us almost 50 years to get these memories together in tandem, right? That he would talk about this. Oh, the same thing was happening to me. I said, well, so what else? What else happened to you? But he, she, he shuts the conversation down every time. He's at a point in his life where he doesn't any longer believe that aliens are a thing. So that's why I say, man, we have some work to do on my brother. But hopefully, you know, hopefully that work will be done and, and he can come into to clear knowing about his own experiences. Thank you. All right. Uh, so how many 20 year and backs have you done or how many, as how far many as I you? know, <laughs> one, but, but, but they seem, you know, because I have some overlapping clone memories, it can feel like there was more than more, you know, like there's more time than 20 years, because if you have multiple clones having, having, um, experiencing time at the same time, it can feel like it's a little bit more. So that's a little confusing, but do you get my meaning? If you've got a few of you running around at the same time, um, yeah. So as far as I know, it's just one. That's plenty. I don't need any more. All right. And what about, uh, so what roles do they primarily get you to do through your different clone bodies? Yeah, this was all, so it took me to Mars. Um, standard, you know, pretty standard going to Mars. They, <clears throat> they train you for a while. I'm already pretty psychically trained at that point. I'm already well aware that I'm not the master of my own experience and that somebody else controls me at all times. You know, I've given myself over, signed myself over to that, that reality. But they're they're training me. They first train me. I mean, they start augmenting you bit by bit. But they train me psychically um, to operate or telekinetically to operate a, a machine, right? 
they do that first. And then they do, they stuck me into a lot of simulated programs, um, like hot, like the, my memories of, and they're very clear when it's a simulated uh, training experience because I feel hyper adrenalized. Like I got like 50 Red Bulls and like they shot me up with amphetamines and then they stuck me in this program to augment me and augment my, my, uh, the internal program because I'm, I'm being, you know, how do we say I'm being created into a cyborg. Ultimately that's the program, but it happens over time. It's not immediate when I go there and I'm nine. So it's again, a pretty precise, um, a, B, C, D, like a timeline that they have in mind. So first it's being telekinetically operating a, a machine, a killing machine, a weaponized machine. And then over time I will become that machine. They trained me to pilot. Um, that was a little later. That didn't happen right away. So piloting um, and eventually for defense force and, you know, patrolling and, and protecting the bases. Right. And they trained me on, you know, as a foot soldier or like combat on, on land. Um, as well. So I felt like Mars was like the place I was never going to leave, like just kind of a lot happened there. Um, but it was, um, it it just felt like it went on and on and on and on and on. And, and just like, I didn't spend 20 years quite there, but it almost feels like it, you know, there's still, there's still more memory to unpack there for as much as memory as I do have. There's, there's still a lot there that is, um, you know, I to want be gotten. Yeah, let's let's discuss a little bit about Mars in just a bit. Let's, but before we do, uh, I want you to describe if you know it. Okay, uh, the moment you think they first abducted you for your twenty year and back, like how how yeah. old? Were you? And yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, I do. Know? I absolutely okay. remember that. Yeah, um, that was in September of eighty two. I was not yet ten. I would be ten the next month, and I remember being, yeah, taken up through the the uh, this in this case it was through the, the side by my, you know, the side of the house. And I remember moving as if in slow motion. Um, in looking back through the kitchen windows, it was evening and the kitchen light was still on. And I just knew that something bad was going to be happen happening to me. And it, it wasn't going to be like it was before. Um, a lot of times there would be insectoids with my abductions up to that point. I don't remember like ant, ant beings as well as Grace being with me. <clears throat> At that point, I don't even remember beings accompanying me. But that's my very crystal clear memory of being taken out and 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 knowing that there was this consciousness, you know, that this is going to go bad and it's going to go on for a long time. Um, yeah, um, that's the clearest I have. And also at the same time, I, you know, I mentioned briefly um, an avatar that's on a benevolent ship with the, I would call them the Galactic Confederation. However, uh, it's a Syrian ship. I just have always called them in a more family-like way. I've called them the Light Alliance. Um, as soon as I cause something, the Galactic Confederation, I don't, you know, it's like so official. I don't want to relate with it. But they, I also have a memory that same night of, of it's almost like a fragment or a split of my body, like a rag doll going straight up into the ship, the benevolent ship. And meeting people there and them talking to me at this, like this is happening in tandem, the dark abduction, the, the light abduction, if you will, um, being taken at once. And that's, you know, two, it, it, it speaks to how I was able to survive all this because I think if, if I hadn't had that relationship and they hadn't preserved part of me that was really essential to my survival and my soul, that I wouldn't be here talking about all this today. I wouldn't have been able to come through all this without it. So that's a that's also very that memory is very very clear on the same night and I'm grateful that I can remember that and that it's it's helped me heal it's helped me contextualize all of this so I understand the bigger picture of the, my soul's journey with it yeah okay wow so many questions let's start how about could you uh, could you respond quickly uh, so they are actually using time travel technology right they you you, you serve for twenty years they reage you put you back. Yeah, with that. I mean, I'm more familiar, most familiar with the time stuff that was going on in Montauk. Yeah. Yeah, we can talk about that down the down the line. There was age regression technology through the silver bullet at Montauk, but let, let me not digress. Yeah, let me not digress. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, before we go to that, um, uh, when they uh, returned you, uh, were, did, was your personality different? Did you like, like Penny Bradley, she mentioned that she started right. speaking in German and her parents right, like, where did you learn? That's wild. Um, I, 
I was starting to go downhill, but I wasn't speaking German. <laughs> I did not speak German. Um, and the Germans didn't own me. I, they, I wasn't involved with the Germans after after the moon in those earlier years that I've mentioned already. Um, I don't remember uh, being with them, so I wouldn't have spoken German. But but true, my, my when I look at pictures from before that time and pictures after that time, there's a really s stark and like a difference Wow. A difference that makes me just want to cry. Like it's so bad. And it was after that time that every year my teacher, a teacher in school would like pull me aside and say, is everything okay at home? And I would just sit there and cry and I would not know what to say. Like, I guess everything's at home, but I feel really fucked up inside. I didn't say that, but that's, you know, I could feel myself falling away. And over the years, you know, eventually I was institutionalized because I didn't want to be alive anymore. But that it took probably it took the better part of 10 years or let's say seven, eight, nine years for that to really, for me to get that far down into the, wow. the depths. Did, yeah. um, did you have self-infliction behaviors, cutting or anything like that? I had really bad eating disorders. I was very, very thin. I was about, I'm almost six feet tall and I weighed about 75 pounds by, by the time that, that I was hospitalized. Um, I, I, I dropped out of school and I was, had no friends and I was just, you know, in my room in the dark, you know, like really it was bad. It was bad. And thankfully, no, I didn't go into cutting, but I, I think if I couldn't, if I hadn't had all the weird eating starvation stuff, I probably would have resorted to cutting or something else that was self mutilation. And those are what you would call alters, I guess, um, from this is a journey to truth is asking, uh, do you get triggered into these alters still? No, I don't. And I, I think that's, and, and, yeah, thank you, Journey to Truth podcast. <laughs> Hello, I think that's a great question. I I think it's because I was up there in in like I said the the my friends on the on the benevolent ship and my mate from Procyon Tiran were making sure that didn't happen. You know, because if that had happened, I wouldn't have gotten to the point of wellness I'm at now, so I can speak fairly coherently on your show, right? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question though, because because that that does happen. I see a lot of people as clients that are still kind of struggling. Um, with bleed through or, or slipping into some other um, reality of self. Sure. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think we've discussed now. Let's uh, how about the, the, the end part of this question? Uh, do you remember when they discharged you? Like what, did they pull you aside and say, well, I'm turning off the video uh, recording and I'm going to speak to you frankly, earth still exists and we're sending you back today. Remember, remember anything like I that? I don't remember that. My last assignment and well, I shouldn't say that I've got other memories that, that are beyond that. I was going to say that my last assignment of recall was with the Draco being owned by the Draco because I was sold in the trade slave trade itself to the Draco. And that is the last recall. I want to say the 20 back, but I don't remember where, it, where was the ending here? Where is the, I remember leaving, but where's the memory of coming back in? It is unclear to me still. I do remember, um, I have some memories. Let me explain why I say like, oh, there's some other stuff that's come in that makes me think that wasn't the end. Um, that I'm on a, I was sent to some, what I call suborbital substations with a skeleton crew of less than 10 people. We were, you know, their uh, designation or their, their solar system ID is based on as astronomical units, which is the, the distance from, you know, you know this, or the earth to the sun. And it seems like I'm in a pretty, but I'm not a super soldier anymore. Like they almost like they retired me to these sort of watching the, the atmosphere and um, patrolling for intruders. But it's, it's a very, uh, I want to say benign, not quite benevolent job, but I am owned by somebody else out there. So I'm on a little tangent here, but, but I don't remember, like, I know a lot of people have memory of the discharge. I don't have memory of that. Yeah. Not, 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 not very clearly of that. Um, but you yeah. do remember when you first got your memories back and I, I know you mentioned that quick, just quickly, just briefly go into that. Cause you mentioned that in the last show we did. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. Really well, really triggered it. Yeah. Yeah. I had a head injury in 2012. I was hit by a car on my bike and had a terrible head injury. Um, yeah, and it was in northern New Mexico, not far from Dulce, where I got hit. That's, you can't make this up, man, right? And after that, things started to really unravel. You know, I'd gotten, I'd patched my life up and gotten, you know, did my thing for a couple decades, and then that happened, and things started coming up. I feel like at that, the moment of the crash, 
and the impact and the concussion, I was like, it was almost like being handed a, 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 a disc, a CD, like, this is your story. This is what happened. I'm not going to show you everything now, but you have it now. It's in here. And over time, because my life was really hit bo bottom at that, you know, this was 11 years ago, I started meditating. I didn't know what else to do. I just knew I was fucked up. And so meditation started to unlock things because it takes me into a deeper brainwave state. You know, we're leaving the beta brain state and going into alpha and deeper down theta, theta state, whatever. And that's a place my subconscious mind started to reveal a lot of things. And then as I got to, closer to my father's death in 2020, in the year and a half leading up to his death was when I started to get the really hardcore space stuff coming back. Okay, so I don't know. Why don't you just tell us what you think about this? And you know, if you don't want to answer it, I mean, or you know, what do you think about proof the of how they they didn't abuse me? The light alliance? No, the, yeah, the dark me. side of how. So you went to these programs. Oh, why, okay. Yeah, why don't they like? Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. You? No, that's a good. That's a good question. You know, yeah. and I I would say to you, absolutely, that's a good question because I have mentioned in the show here today that I, there was an element of my own agency in like signing up for all of this at, from the, the, the perspective of the soul. What am I here for? If I hadn't gone and experienced all of those things, I don't see myself as a victim anymore at all. I mean, that's a, a way station on the journey, but it's not a place for me to camp out. I've become a sovereign being again. But anyway, if I hadn't gone and experienced all that, I couldn't be speaking firsthand about all of these things. And it would take that, it would take being in what I call the belly of the bees to, to um, be a voice of disclosure publicly. Um, and I, I couldn't have done it without, you know, to couldn't do this now without the experiences. And they've taught me so much. Like if it wouldn't have been the programs, I would have found some really other, really dark stuff to go through. Just that's how I am. I have extremes that I gravitate to in this lifetime, in this embodiment, it's my personality. I want to know. I wanted to know about this, and so um, the 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 Light Alliance and those guys don't. It's not a matter of approving it, but we wanted to know about the galactic slave trade, and I learned a lot firsthand. So it was my own. We could say I vetted myself to come down and do this, and I don't regret it. Can you describe exactly what is the Light Alliance? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And I I I, I touched on this this uh, let me deepen this or explain it a little better the light alliance is just my sort of colloquial term for the galactic confederation um so it's you know the light alliance is like the family name for that you know my my friends up there and my um you know really benevolent uh guardians i also consider them my guardians in so many ways still still um, the federation we could debate for a long time but there's different factions of that it's 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 there's so much to it and our ship was more about um a lot of observation uh not a lot of 3d intervention um other than like working with time and dimension so that we could head off certain things at the past but a lot of our of our um we wanted to know about enslavement in this kind of quadrant of, of the galaxy uh yeah that's, a, that's probably in a whole nother show. So I hope I've explained that sufficiently. Uh, yeah, for sure. I, I have so many more questions about it. We'll, we'll just have to move on because uh, we've got, we're only like halfway done here with topics tonight because I know we've got this, <laughs> this one maybe even, uh, yeah, may take us a while. So your interactions with the reptilians and mantis. So why don't you just, I don't know, where, where, do, where would you want to start from that? Ah, okay. Yeah. So um, let's go into... Well, let's talk about the reptilians. They're, you know, I'm, I'm kind of partial to these reptilians. So, and I'll explain why. <laughs> partial to reptilians. What do you mean? Let me, let me unpack that. So as, as I, you know, I mentioned being a pilot and, you know, with, with Defense Force, right? And this is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. And I'm so grateful I had these memories. I crashed out there, you know, so I'm out patrolling in my, my, this junky old craft that I had, um, that was like this old helicopter that had been retrofitted for Mars. This is the craft I, I, I piloted many craft on Mars, but that's the one I remember best for whatever reason. Um, and I'm wired, you know, I'm wired from my head back to central command. So that's why I'm allowed to be out or I and others are allowed to be out piloting alone. Um, they know where I am, but I crashed and I, I have a feeling I was shut down, but the beings that picked me up are these, these, um, these reptilians who are native to the planet and they lived underground. So I, in my own journals, I write about them is that the reptilians that saved me and also kind of stole me. 
and really interesting experience with them. With them, they, they brought me back to their underground, um, I don't know, I guess I would call it civilization. And I lived with them for a while. And they, they were not advanced in the ways we think about advancement. They had regressed because they were, they were a small group. There weren't many left. And they were, they were a bit inbred. Um, these reptilians were small, uh, a little bit round. We might consider them from our vantage point here on Earth to be a little bit homely. Nothing like the Draco. Not at all like the Draco. And um, like, like I said, they didn't, have, um, they didn't have weaponry and craft and tech the way we think of tech, but they had spiritual tech, what I would call spiritual technology. They were interacting with the spiritual energies of, of Mars, of their planet. Mars being a living being, just like Terra is a living being. We can interact with those energies. And they've been able to um, create what they needed to survive underground. They had survived a cataclysm on Mars. And that's what why they were an isolated group out there. Um, but uh, my memory of being with them is actually some of my best memories from the programs because they treated me like one of them. I had never experienced this before as a slave. And uh, it's emotional. Like I could feel that now, like, wow, you know, to, to eat with them and to be in the space with them where they, in a way they honored me in a way they didn't, they ended up cannibalizing me for parts for technology. And they wanted to understand my biology and my tech. Um, remember I've got, a, I'm built out with a lot of tech as a cyborg and I'm cloned at this point. Um, but I lived with them in a, in a, in a state of relative peace for a while. And for me out there, it was like, this is like heaven. And I, and I've, 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 you know, I was at a, a, at a council meeting. I didn't really understand what was going on because they didn't ha seem to have t telepathic communication. I couldn't understand through psychic means what was happening, but <clears throat> there was a, a meeting about what they should do with me. And it was decided that they should try and, you know, save themselves. Right. So we could say that's pretty low, but, but it's remember my yardstick, what we're talking about, like all the abuse I'd suffered up to this point. I'm like, this is nothing. This is great. Just keep me here for a while. I don't care. It was just, it, it was um, extraordinary to have had, and also that they had, you know, they had water under there. It was a little bit of an oasis. There was something, I mean, like trees underground and, and um, a really benevolent environment. This is how I remember them. And I, like I said, I think they were a pretty isolated group. And I remember them uh, how it came through my memories was like, they wanted to inspect my soul. They wanted to know if I had a soul. And I think partly curiosity uh, got the better of them as far as like um, taking me apart, so to speak. So I didn't survive that. I wasn't brought back to the base and, and the, the tracking device that would have been with me and in me um, was broken. And that's why I think they didn't from the base come and find me. Yeah. Oh. Um, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a really so extraordinary story. How about you? Can you describe, um, I think you've already done it in the previous video, but for people who don't want to go back and listen to it all over again, tell right. us what they actually look like. How tall were they? What color were they? Did yeah, they, they were, they were green. They were green and kind of, I would say maybe, maybe like four feet tall, um, a lighter yellow, yellowy green on their, their chest and like a roundness, a little bit of, um, maybe plumpness uh, to them, as I recall. And like I said, no tail. Um, they were, they were quick and nimble. They were, um, there was a grace to how they moved and they were very much at one with their environment. So, um, but they, they lived largely underground. I mean, I think it was a risk for them to come above ground to find me and, you know, but largely they were subterranean. Uh, do you remember what they call themselves? No idea what they call themselves. Did, <laughs> no they no actually, idea. Did they ever speak to you? Um, I guess you throw a mouth like grunt, gruntle sounds or anything. Yeah, they had. I mean, it was it was weird. They had their own method of communication with each other, but it wasn't telepathic, and it didn't seem to be like um, almost like a verbal language. It was through. It was like movements, and it was. I mean, we would consider it kind of crude. We would consider it like really, really basic. I'm sure they were communicating um, complex complex ideas, but it was through a lot of hand, uh, like movement of the body, movement of the hand, movement of the eyes. Um, and maybe it was a different color kind of te telepathy that I didn't understand. I couldn't pick up on it uh, psychically. I'm really not sure about that. And there was a, you know, the gutter, guttural sounds, um, but it was a combination of those things, really unique kind of um, very, something felt really ancient about it. Yeah. 
All right. And um, what kind of food would they uh, serve you? Yeah, there's something very, um, I remember it as a, like a, almost like a succulent, this big fat green, like a fat leaf, like a, yeah, like a, a desert plant almost or something. But it was vegetable. It was a vegetable matter that they gave me. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what did it taste like? Oh, it didn't taste like much. I mean, it was fine. It wasn't, it wasn't, um, it didn't have much flavor to me. Like either way, it was pretty, it was pretty neutral, you know, it wasn't sharp or pungent. It was fine. I would have eaten more happily. I'm sure I did. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you see other, any other people there, hum, human type people being held? No, they had you? never seen a human. They had, I felt like I'd been like dropped out of an airplane into some pygmy tribe and, you know, wherever, like they'd never seen a human. That's why they were like, what is she? You know, they're like, wow, far out. Like, was it a he or she or what was I at that point? What, you know, it'd be interesting uh, to, to see myself through their eyes. Like, what must I have seemed like to them? Right. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Here's a great question from, oh, okay, I don't know who said it. But anyway, were they vegan? I don't think that they were, but a lot, you know, we could we could make an assumption that they were fairly vegetarian because a lot of what I saw there was like vegetable matter. They didn't, you know, I think that they, they were, I think they were opportunists and probably what happened was that they were able to grow a lot of stuff. And so they adapted to that over time. Remember these, this, this group was seemed to be dying out. So I, I think they would have, you know, if they could hunt above ground or whatever, they would have, but yeah. All right. And uh, did the these reptilians know that you went through a lot of trauma and tried to heal you? Oh, yeah. I'm sure they knew I'd been through a lot of trauma. And I'm wondering, too, if, 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 if they, from their spiritual perspective, did they also think that they were doing me a favor, you know, by terminating, you know, something that had been so from their mind, like think about spiritual beings working with the spiritual energy of a planet you know, something that is so far gone from its original blueprint, you know, are you liberating the thing and liberating its energy to kind of put an end to it? I think that might have been also part of their perspective. Uh, Thomas is asking, do you remember the uh, original aboriginals or whatever, the aboriginal Martians? I think these were them. Uh, what um, I think actually this, these were actually um, olive skin humanoids. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they can breathe the low oxygen environment just fine. Did you ever encounter any like hu humans that had this olive colored skin? Oh, no, no, excuse me. No, I didn't. I did not okay. meet them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so I guess the next question would be what did uh, their living quarters look like or their city that you? Oh, had? it wasn't a city. You know, what I remember is largely like the trees and like really natural, like indigenous, indigenous um, environment very um, at one with nature. And it wasn't, you know, when I say there is subterranean, um, it's not like they lived in a cave. It was, it had its own light source. It had water, it had, you know, it was very natural. It's all natural. There was no city. There was, and it, the, remember the group was very small, maybe, <clears throat> maybe 30 or 40, you know, it's not, there's not by far any, 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 anything like a, that you'd have a sophisticated um, structure for community that would need a city. Yeah. All right. Uh, so when you, you say they tore, I guess they tore you apart. Uh, were they like, uh, did they have, were they trying to analyze your cybernetics? Were they advanced technologically? Yeah, yeah no, they, I've already, I, I think I said that they didn't have any, they didn't have any tech. And that's why, that's why it was so compelling to them. Like, what is this? Like this technology is not something we've seen before. Like I said, they didn't have any craft. They didn't have weapons. Yeah. Um, they didn't have any of that. Um, they, they, they were, yeah, in, in our terms, we'd say they were a little bit backward, but I would say just observing their spiritual development was exquisite, absolutely exquisite. So we have to rethink what is technology, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, all right. So at that point, I guess they tore you apart and you died. Uh, did soul, like end of story, yeah. Did yeah. your soul get transferred back to another clone body? Is that how that works? It seemed like it naturally went back to, you know, migrating back to where it was supposed to go. And then for some reason, they always seemed like they had a dossier of <clears throat> clones at the ready because I was, you know, I died so many times. Like it, when it was just like, repeat, let's start over. 
Um, I mean, I do have memories of being killed, you know, by the, by the spider on Mars and, and it's very palpable of, of like, at first my consciousness has no idea where to go over time, like over some, some moments there, it does know where to go, but it's a pretty disjointing feeling to, um, to okay. be in between in be in that in between area. Well, how about this? Uh, so let's go to the next topic here. Uh, the Mars defense force. Um, I wonder, uh, did you want to talk at all about the mantis? Oh we, yeah. I'm the, oh, yeah. We yeah. skipped. Okay. I'm Paul. So go ahead and tell us what go. Yeah. So what? Yeah. Well, in any order you want, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. I mean, the mantis were, you know, I mentioned that um, the reptilians were not so much living you know, in like caves, but the, the mantids, God, we had so many skirmishes with the mantids over time there. And it seemed endless, endless, endless. The devious ways we were trying to co-opt them and kill them and whatever, experiment on them in a way. Um, they lived in a very um, upper dimensional subterranean lab. I would call, I call it a labyrinth. That's my shorthand with myself, right? Labyrinth. Um, they, they were also, I mean, I would say we could call them native, but but I know that they had come from elsewhere, but so long ago, you might as well consider the mantids native to Mars. Uh, they took up residence from what I observed through my memories and psychically, they took up residence in what we I would call like the ancient ancient beings, very, very tall beings that left a lot of beautiful architecture, high, highly elevated, super advanced, um, super quantum technology. They those beings, uh, I know they've been called previously by someone else as ancient, the ancient builders. They left something behind there on Mars and the mantids came in at some point, at least the ones that I was familiar with, uh, and co-opted that structure because it had such a high energetic frequency and made it their own. And I remember going, we were sent, we were tasked with um, trying to understand the, 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 the frequency fence that that they had within built into the technology of their underground domicile it protected them and we were trying to figure out how to defuse it um i know we went over there one time with a like a pow <laughs> and like th thrust them into the into the frequency fence and the pow the person being blew up um, again, we're talking about frequency. If you're not in a certain frequency range, you're not going to be able to get through the frequency fence. You're not. So they had, they had a man, a mantid with them and they threw it into the frequency fence. No, we did. We were from defense force. We were tasked with going over there and trying to, you know, figure out the technology. Um, and we brought, instead of putting ourselves in harm's way to fi find out what would have, and we brought a POW from the base, um, prison and through them. And we were the ones throw, throwing the, the, the person into the field to see what happened. And they, they were terminated. Yeah. All right. And wow. Okay. So describe what these uh, mantis beams look like. Yes. <laughs> I remember them as being kind of beautiful. I mean, the greenish hue, but I remember them having a, a light emittance to them. Um, like there's, there were, I call them elders. We were always trying to get at the mantid elders because the mantid elders were, let's say, tasked or uh, <clears throat> had the authority over the the, the entire um, the, the entire code for the whole group, right? They're I wouldn't call them a hive mind, but they have a code that keeps them in the unity field, right? Um, and so the elders were they always again we're talking about elder spiritual race here. Um, that's how I always perceive them. And I have a lot of, I think it's a kind of guilt that we were sent over there to try and kill them. Um, they had no beef with us, man. They didn't. Um, I've drawn a drawing of, of um, a mantid elder that has like a robe, like a blue robe on. So the, the elders seem to have like a higher, you know, somewhat higher status or, you know, they were just tasked with, with keeping the group together and keeping the group coherent in a, again, in a spiritual and, and, um, uh, dimensional way with frequency. So, and they were tall, they were probably, I don't know, eight, seven, seven, seven feet tall, tall uh, taller than I, for sure. And um, I never felt afraid when I would look at a mantis. Like I, I, maybe I got used to looking at them. We also had them on the base, you know, we, we, we had them working for us. I remember waking up from some kind of augmentation and having two mantids over me and they were looking at each other and I could tell they were going, Oh, do we fuck it up? Like, do we do we screw this one up? We're going to be in trouble if we did. So we had them on the base as mechanics and techs and um, surgeons and so on, right? 
and and how we did that is through mind controlling them. We we I remember going over um, with with Dean, my 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 twin, my psychic twin. We had a small company. We went over there. We we gassed them and then we bombarded them with frequency. This was our orders, not because we wanted to. We were we were mind controlled slaves, right? Uh, bombarded them with frequency. And in that moment of, of creating trauma for these mantids, we would inject another frequency with, that would invert them and allow us to control them. And, you know, as many as we could and bring them back to the base, they'd be under a kind of spell or mind control so we could use them at the base. So it's pretty highly devious, you know, really devious behavior here. Yeah. All right. So why were you humans or whoever you, MDF or whoever you're with, or why were they attacking these mantis? What did they do? That yeah, isn't that the beautiful? Thank you for that question. <laughs> they didn't do anything. You know, they would have been perfectly happy. They they belong there. You know, we came in, set up shop. They would have been happy to have us around. You know, if we had just left them alone. But we didn't. Like we kind of carried on the same way we did with Native Americans when we set foot on this North American continent. And, and to, to our commanders, it was like the mantas were target practice. You know, go use your weapons on the mantids, go mantid hunting. You know, it's pretty disgraceful. But but to hone our, our skills and to do something when we were bored and to, to try and get more of them over there to work for us and really to decimate them. You know, we wanted the territory. And I think it's, it's bringing a, a, a kind of power over paradigm to Mars and, and letting that play out. And, and, and by the way, I would say, too, my experience at, at Mars plays out that indeed the Mars colonies were run by psychopaths. So, you know, not everything is going to make sense. There's a, there's a, and I was in the cesspool of the programs. This is back in, you know, we're talking about the eighties, right? I think things had changed over time to, to be a little bit more um, even and fair. Uh, I'm not sure, but that's my impression. Well, did you ever get to visit the uh, Mantis cities? If they, I guess, did they ever allow you to come in and actually see what it was? So they didn't allow us to come in. <laughs> but we, oh, oh. We, okay. Well, so my twin and I, Dean, um, we we were twins, so we would be able to do, among other things, psychic recall together. And I remember viewing, we would remote view it psychically together. That's how we were activated as twins. And I remember looking into, I mean, it's opulent. It's the, the frequency, you know, it's like... Uh, it's like there were striations of crystal or diamond in the walls or something emanating, pulsating and alive. And I remember looking into this room where they were, the elders were strategizing and there was this tall table they were standing on, standing at over. And it seemed to have, it, this seemed techy, like it felt like glass that was lit up with like light, like symbols or something that were moving on this, uh, I don't, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was an upper dimensional or, you know, off world metal or something, but it was, this almost seemed like a lie. Like they were looking into this for information and it was fascinating. I mean, I don't know exactly what, what the tech was or what it was made out of, but they were interfacing with this thing that was like, we would say it was like, Oh, it was like a big cell phone or a big, you know, thing, but, but it had a consciousness. It was fascinating. Uh, was it so it was like some kind of looking glass technology? Yeah, it seemed to be. It seemed to be. And it was changing, you know, it was changing before my eyes. Like it was almost like the, the symbols and writing were coming up off the table, like they were reaching toward them or something. There was a really dynamic interface going on with the mantids and this 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 tech that they had. Yeah. Uh, well, so were you actually able to interface with it yourself? No. No. Okay. Mm -mm. No, we were, we were, you know, playing, we, we were sneaking in there mentally, psychically, right. To see okay. what we could see and know what we could know and gather okay. until. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so did the, uh, these mantis, do they ever wear, do they wear clothes? Yeah. I felt the, 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 um, the elders, like I said, I, I observed some of them wearing like a robe or something, um, like a, like a, it's a more elevated garment, but a lot of them seemed like they had nothing. Like they were just you know, naked, naked mantids. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, um, did the humans ever make a truce between the mantis eventually? Oh, you would think like brilliant question, right? Like, why don't you just make a truce? Of course. That's like the logical thing is we're sitting here talking about it now. To my knowledge, no. All we did was wage war on those poor mantis. That's my recollection. And you remember somebody else might have a different, different experience on Mars in the same program. But this was this was my recollection is that there was no truce. Absolutely. Absolutely okay. not. Did did they ever get a hold of a mantid elder? 
Oh, we were trying to kill him. Yeah. Well, I don't know if we got them and brought them with us. You know, because oh, here's a, I mean, we could predict this, right? They could leave their bodies. The elders could leave via consciousness. They could leave their bodies. So you could get a body, you kill the body, but they wouldn't be gone. Isn't that interesting? So I don't think they would be useful as a POW or, like, you know, like get them and, you know, pull them back to the base and try and, you know, do that with them. They were way yeah. higher consciousness. I know yeah. some whales do that when they try to bring them into captivity. They just end up dead in a couple of days. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Maybe that's a similar thing. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, did uh, did these mantis ever make any sounds? And if they did, what what, what do you think it would sound like? Oh, that's a good question. I have to think about that because I, all the sounds, like when I think about sounds, it's telepathic. Like they're they're highly telepathic. All these beings are very telepathic. So it's almost like a you know, is it a telepathic sound? I don't know. I, I you know, there I don't remember precise sounds that were signature to to their race per se. Yeah. Um, were they also were they very technologically advanced? Like they used a lot of technology in their lives, or were they very they just limited amounts of it? Well, the, the the tech thing that I observed, the two tech things were there, the place they were living was just like so opulent. I mean, it's amazing that I got the experience to see all of that. And uh, that tech that, you know, like I talked about the frequency fence and the, the energy, the labyrinth that protected them. And it was, it was alive. It was conscious. That's very techy. But, and, and also the table I've described, this tech that they had, you know, like you said, like a looking glass technology. Other than that, I never, I don't think they had any kind of craft or, you know, uh, particularly weapon technology, for for example, you know they are some of the, the mantis that were working for us at the base. We had co-opted. Uh, they ambushed us one night in our own craft from the base, and they were bombing us from from the air. I mean, they decimated the base, and they had help from outside groups to do this. But it wasn't their own tech. It wasn't mantis technology. It was ours, and they knew exactly how it worked. And I, I had my leg blown off. I mean, I, I was very injured that night. And it's a night I'll never forget because the firefight was so bad um, and, and very unexpected. It's one of my my worst worst battle memories. Um, absolutely. Yeah. So when they uh, blow, blew off your leg, uh, did they, uh, I don't know, give you surgery? Were you amputee for the rest of your life or... or is it yeah, this is my million dollar question because my mind, my my memory goes black. I know there's somebody at that moment, there's somebody running, there's a guy running by me. He's like, get up, man, we're going to fucking die. <laughs> and, and I, I have no leg. My left leg is gone and they're screaming and they're running. The other. My memory has gone. I, I don't know if they use a regen or if I expired um, right. and they had to take another clone. So uh, you, you mentioned this other person, Dean is, is this person uh, someone, you know, in the here and now, and uh, could they come on our, the show? Maybe with you. Yeah, I wish he was ready to do that, Dean. <laughs> oh, Dean. And Dean's a Dean's a place in my heart. He, I have not met him personally. He came to me in the fall of 2021. He came psychically. Uh, he, I was out on some land that I like to walk on in West Texas, where I was living at the time, really remote land, and I felt this protective male energy behind me, and I knew it was benevolent, and I was just like checking it out. And I had actually been thinking about the Mars Mantis at the time that the energy showed up. And then I felt them on my right and my left. And I didn't really understand it fully. And when I went back home later that night, he said, you don't know me yet, but you saved my life. You saved my life. Uh, and over the following days, that was the introduction. Um, I could see him psychically, everything but his face, his reddish receding hair as if we're the same age, right? Like coming to me from his the physical aspect that he has now his t-shirt, his jeans is very precise, what he was wearing on his feet and, and everything, but the face is pixelated, but I came to know him as Dean and he's come to me as his, uh, as his, you know, the guy he is now in real time, he's on the, in the Northeast, in the East, Eastern Northeast quadrant of the U S right now. He's come to me as a super soldier self and his altar named Dean or excuse me, Neil. And he's come to me like as a, as, as his higher self and also as like a wounded animal in pain or like an animal that's been hit in the road. He's in so much pain. And we, we relate only telepathically, psychically occasionally. And I've kind of, I blocked it. I have to admit I blocked it. It's pretty painful um, because he, he's not in a great place. Right. But through him, I understand what happened with the twinning. And I, this was something, you know, when you and I had first talked, I had no idea. And in part of me is like, I wish I hadn't known about this. This was like so degraded. Um, 
the, the twinning process happened with Dean at Great Lakes Naval Station, north of Chicago. That's where I was sent and we were twinned through trauma bonding in cages before we were sent to Mars. So, and we were nine, we were both little at that point. And we were, you know, psychically mated, sexually mated, emotionally mated, we were bonded spiritually. And that's, that is the twinning program. You know, it is taken out of the Illuminati playbook and usually always, always in the, in the, in the things that govern how the twinning plays out. I mean, go back to Mengele's experiments on twins in Auschwitz in the 1940s. You know, the twins are made to betray each other and watch each other hurt and then hurt each other. And they're, it's like enmeshment and codependency taken to another level. Like when he has come to me and, and related with me in real time now, like in the past couple of years, when we relate psychically, I can't tell if it's him or me saying something. And that's how wed we were at that time during the, we, the time in the programs. It's like, I, I can't tell his thought from mine. It's pretty eerie. I've never had tele telepathy like that. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what plays out, uh, you know, with his memory ret retrieval and where he is with his journey with uh, the programs over time. But I, I think of him and then I, you know, kind of don't think about him. So. Okay. Well, Dean, if you're watching this, get Dean, on if you're time. watching this, <laughs> get it together. Yeah. All right. So, um, were you twinned by a project paperclip scientist? Some like, I don't know for sure who, you know, what, I mean, it was degraded. Of course it was, it was depraved what they were doing to us together. Um, yeah, I don't know if it was a pay, I have no idea. I mean, some depraved mind could have been paperclip, could have not, you know, this was, so, in, so, this was 82. So. Yeah, yeah. What, what is, when you say depraved, uh, without, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah. Too yeah. graphic, like typically what would it be like? What, how, how would they actually twin? Yeah, it was a lot of they would let they would leave us in a cage together and help us help each other because we were deprived a lot of food and clothes and water and shelter and all that. And so you put two kids in a cage and they they learn to survive together. They learn to rely on each other. They learn to com uh, comfort each other. They learn to love each other. And then they would take us out and make each other m miss each other. Right. And over time, they would. T two things they would make like they would make me watch Dean being abused by a handler which is once you become that wed and you are so enmeshed with this person, it's like you're being abused. Everything that happened to him is coming through my body and I am made to feel that I'm responsible. And likewise, they would do the same thing, abuse me and make him watch. And ultimately we're going to be made to abuse each other, torture each other, betray each other and harm each other. That's part of the program. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, so I guess we can maybe move on to the next topic. If that sounds okay for you. How about we go to this one? I really want to get to, uh, and if we still have time, we can hit the Mars Defense Force thing next. But um, uh, you're uh, out there, the silver bullet. So tell us what what is what is this about? Oh, I'll get my <laughs> yeah yeah. Okay, the silver bullet. Let me unpack the silver bullet. So um, at some point in Montauk, you know, I was there in the late seventies. Um, I wasn't ever. I have no memories of being in the Montauk. I mean, it's like a coffin, like silver. It's very sleek and you lie down in it like a, you know, like a MRI machine or something. And they light it up with electricity. There's plasma fields going places related to plasma fields and, and um, excuse me, torsion fields and plasma physics and also electrokinetics, electrogravitics going on with this thing. And they would put, I mean, it's a, it's a torture device. I call it a time tunnel torture tube actually, but it's, you know, they're mind fracturing me with this technology, right? As a, as a sort of sideshow of getting me to look into future potentials um, at the same time. So what happened back in January um, of this year, like I'd always wondered, James, why I couldn't remember what I had been sent to view in that time tunnel torture tube, the silver bullet, as I call it. Uh, and those memories, a few of those um, viewings opened up for me um, in the last couple of months. And it's difficult because I'm, it's almost like I'm being brought back into the memory and I'm feeling all of the, it's, it's extremely painful for the body. And I know I can feel like I hear myself, like my little young child self screaming in the background because they're, they, they light it up with electric and it's coming through my body. That's how they're sort of getting it to work with plasma. Um, and Augie, you mentioned Augie. Augie is the, the young child aspect of me that experienced everything in Montauk. And she's a, she's a child part that I worked with heavily to kind of integrate that experience, which was 
all in all very horrific and very abusive. Um, and, and Augie is still, she's pretty well integrated, but I see it's still sometimes, you know, I feel her as a somewhat separate entity, at, you know, age six or seven. And she doesn't look like anything like me. You know, it's like she was the, was the split off part of me. So we could say she was sent into the silver bullet to experience all of these things. And I guess I could say, maybe this would be interesting to, to viewers who are working on memory retrieval, like how did these particular memories open up? Well, I when I wake up in the morning, I often lie, I'm staying in bed and I'm doing a kind of somatic breath work that takes me into a deeper brainwave state. And it's through those that state, it's almost like a light trance that I felt myself almost like, I would call it like a self-regression. At first, I didn't know what the fuck was happening. I was being taken into, I could feel it like back into this machine, but I knew there was a point to it. And the first recall I had was actually being sent out to view something in Russia. And it was a, I was sent into a room with big monitors, uh, big screens and a, some kind of portaling technology that's connected to uh, a Pleiadian ship. And in this, future time potential that it was sent to view back decades ago, the, the Russians themselves were having a uh, benevolent um, uh, alliance with the Pleiadians. And I mean, it was a be actually a beautiful viewing. Um, if I can divorce myself from everything that's that's gone on with the silver bullet to get me to the point where I can actually go view this. Um, they would, you know, tell me what was needed kind of through hyp hypnotic techniques and drugging. They're altering my mind so I can receive what I'm supposed to find in space time in the future as a target. So I'm locating the target and this is where I was sent. But in this memory recall, they're yelling my handlers at Montauk are yelling at me to, to get certain information and I'm blocking it and they keep turning up the juice in, in the silver bullet. And it's very painful. Um, but at the same time, I'm aware of a Pleiadian lady, a nice Pleiadian lady, as I call her in my, in my memories from my child's perspective, I am reaching for that Pleiadian lady and they know that I'm doing it because I want to make contact with her. I want to make contact with this. She is all things benevolent. She's all things kind and loving and sweet. And that's the everything that I don't have at Montauk. And so I'm reaching for her and they're to, like, they're trying to slam the technology down. So I don't make contact with her, but that memory will live with me forever now. But, but it was really interesting to see this, the timeline potential where Russia is cooperating with benevolence. And in fact, it's a, it's a, it's an alliance that they have, which I think is current, although it didn't seem in my recall to have anything to do with war. It was nothing to do with conquest and domination. Um, it was about, exploration of space and communion among the races. And, um, you know, I'm aware that Edgar Casey back in the thirties had a, had a, um, a reading that he, that he did in which, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but in Russia is the salvation of the world, you know, is the hope of the world. And, and is that possibly true now? So I think the reason that I was given these memories that opened up, uh, the viewings, you know, that I had from the seventies and the silver, silver bullet, because there's something happening with that. Now I think they're current now. Wow. Uh, so many questions. So let's start with, uh, how about the actual silver bullet device? Uh, what can you describe what it looked like and maybe t give us some information on how the plasma helped you yeah. see the future? Yeah. Isn't it? Oh my God. The tech, the tech on this is, is, far out. So I don't know all there is to know from my child's mind and how I recall this, but uh, there's a lot going on with tech. So, I mean, it, to look at it, it looks a little bit plain. Like, like I said, I mean, it's a, it's elevated off the floor. It's like stepping into a, a, a more sleek looking coffin. It's like a, it is a bullet in that it's tapered on each end and it closes entirely over me. However, when I'm inside of it, there's an oscillation with my physical form. And I think this has something to do with torsion fields where I'm, I'm somewhat levitated off the, the surface. So I'm not actually lying on anything. And there's this vibrational quality to my body and all the, the supercharged particles that are going on, you know, inside of that thing. Um, I do not know exactly everything relevant to the tech with that. I do know though, how that it's, if we take charged particles, you know, what's electrokinetic, you know, I, I wrote something, I, you know, something I, I wrote down about this. Uh, I had to research this, but it made a lot of sense. 
with what I was recalling, electrokinetics occurs when an electrically charged surface causes liquid gases or solids to move from one point to the other. Because the results of electrokinetic in interactions include movement, this is a form of propulsion, means that the data algorithms and theories of electrokinetics can predict how and why specific electrogravitic concepts will succeed. So um, that was a mouthful, but there's, there's, there's a, I mean, my inquiry on this is going to be ongoing um, to gather more information about the tech because there's something phenomenal going on here uh, that I cannot entirely explain. But it's 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 more than just sticking a kid into a you know electricity device and lighting her up, you know, electroshocking her. There's quite a lot more going on, and and I think too about how how has this uh, technology changed over time? You know, if we're talking about this is in the late seventies. What the heck has happened in the last forty years with time travel? Like this might have been considered somewhat crude for that, you know, that era, or or we would consider it crude perhaps now. Um, and also, what's compelling is that they're not telling me anything but what you know what they want me to find. But in space time, I am finding the target in the future. So that is also pretty interesting. You know, remember that my psychic ability is very much amplified. It's kind of on steroids within these programs, and that's also compelling. So. For the, the question, I don't know if I can answer it adeptly. I mean, I'm not a plasma physicist. I don't exactly know everything, but I'm very much hot on the trail to learn more through my memories. Okay, well, uh, Rebecca, if you build yourself a silver bullet, uh, one that doesn't <laughs> people, let's, let's go take a look at the future, okay? Um, yeah. I suppose yeah. you couldn't really comment more about what you saw in the future because, right, I think you said that you didn't- you Well, didn't I could tell you it. one more, another, okay. another one that, I mean, was mind blowing. This was- about a week later after that first one, um, I had another similar, there's a whole, the whole thing being regressed back into the thing. And there's a, there's, by the way, there's a Navy handler lady, a na lady who um, is in charge of me while I'm in the silver bullet. And she's, you know, I look to her for comfort, which is so fucking pathetic. Right. But she has a little, she has a little Navy blue skirt and a little Navy blue hat and a little Navy blue top and her little nylons and her little shoes. And uh, anyway, she's always like kind of taking me in and out of this thing. And they would do, they would bring me back, back uh, and like give me like 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and then they'd shoot me out again. I mean, it's horribly painful. And the, the I'm going to, I want to, I'm getting off topic because you had asked about the other retrieval, um, one of the others. But I wanted to say too that the silver bullet could be used to age regress. So if you speed it up, you go into the future, slow it down, you go into the past, right? That's pretty crazy. That's pretty wild. Um, but but for the the second retrieval, I can make this a little bit brief. I was I went into a it was an American military base that was um, being about to be bombed. So I see this a super. It, it comes through my memory as like a supersonic uh, missile coming into an American base. It feels like it's overseas. There's a body of water on the right and a brick facade of buildings on the left and um, Af African-American commander um, There's of a, of a group of uh, seem to be army soldiers that are doing drills in the road. They are unarmed and there's this missile coming in and ETs show up and I think it's, it felt like the same Pleiadian group um, coming in and they intercept the bombing and they reveal themselves in broad daylight, which was like, holy shit. They reveal themselves and the soldiers are like, they look up like they've seen God or angels. They are totally accepting of what just happened. So meaning this is a this is a scenario of disclosure in which no one is afraid. Like the ETs reveal in broad daylight and no one is frightened. And like, this is amazing. So, I mean, it's just one potential that I viewed, but, but, but could that be something that is on deck for us now? I don't know. Yeah. So when you say the device tortured you, uh, what makes it painful? Uh, was it like just the frequencies or sound? Yeah, it was all the electricity, the electricity. Okay. And there's some kind of that my, feels like my body is kind of in a uh, washing machine going really fast. I mean, it's, it's, there's a spinning quality. I feel dizzy. I feel nauseous. And this was coming through in the first recall. I had a lot of very visceral memory coming through my body. I felt sick to my stomach and, and like this spinny, spinny, um, dizzy feeling, but it's the electric and they're, they're lighting it up harder and harder and harder. Like they're putting more juice. Like you would kill a kid. 
I mean, I heard them in one recall saying there's this, these two voices, there's the handler lady and the, some of the techs in the room, and they're saying, we can't do this again yet, we'll kill her. And they're saying, we have to, you know, the lady's saying, we just have to keep going. We have to go and get our, you know, duties done for the day. I horrifying, but it's mostly, it's mostly the electric. Wow. Uh, okay. Yeah. What about your, um, your Augie alter? Uh, was that, was she in a clone body and why did they? No, have to... okay. she wasn't a, she was never like a, you know, when she wasn't in a clone body, no. And she wasn't really an alter in the, in the sense of the typical sense of the word, but she was, um, you know, when we all know this, everybody watching knows this, when there's trauma of this magnitude, the, the mind splits off into a thousand pieces to survive. Right. <clears throat> and, and Augie was like the, the one, the part of me in my mind that kind of experienced all these things from a child's perspective. Right. But I have always seen her as like an inner child. I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe for in your parlance would consider maybe an altar. I don't know. Um, and, she came back to me first in almost like dream, lucid dream experiences. And I, I didn't recognize her, but I knew it was a part of me. And um, I call her Augie because it's other girl. The other girl is all, all I wrote in my notes. And my journals was like the other little girl. I know she's me and she's mine. When Augie first came in, she couldn't see me. She couldn't hear. It was like, she was deaf and dumb and mute. Like she was really gonzo. So I hope that explains it. Um, okay. You know, maybe we could call her an altar, but it wasn't in the typical sense where like the handlers had programmed this other girl named Augie. So I hope that you know, I hope that's clarified. Okay. Well, should we move on to the last uh, topic? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've been going for a while. You you want to try try to hit this topic was quickly as possible because I know you said we you wanted you, we we wanted to limit this to ninety minutes. We're past that limit now. So. I know. I'm like I'm I'm getting done. <laughs> Tell us more about time. MDF, MDF. Oh, I think I said that it was it was the it was the appointment in the programs that seemed like it was never going to end. I mean, we talked about that. So my my you know defense force, man. You know, I feel like our commanders were there was something psychopathic in how they handled us. And a lot of times we would be out on on you know patrol with. I remember just being in a small unit like of seven a lot of times it seemed like just seven of us, um, maybe, maybe a dozen at a time, but we were never in, in mass. It seemed like we were trained together and we would operate together. I mean, we talk about Dean and Dean was in that command, right? <clears throat> but a lot of it was seemed in many ways, you know, I've talked about the, the mantids and, and other things, but a lot of it was sort of boring. Like there was elements of it that were actually pretty mundane and just, you know, moving through, moving through life and um, like a lot of training and nothing, you know, I have to say uh, to sort of credit in a backhand way, the programs and programmers and the controllers and everything. I mean, everything was so precise, like nothing is wasted. I noticed that when I was with the Germans, like there's a rhyme and reason for everything and nothing is like, nothing is superfluous. Nothing is, has no function. Like if they're going to train and program you in a certain way, there's a reason for it. And it's all a progression. And, and me starting it, you know, from the time I was born up until <clears throat> Mars, there was a point to all of that. So I feel too, in many ways, my time with Defense Force um, trained me to then become the, the, the biggest and best, you know, super soldier that I could be. Then they would clone me and sell me out. They would trade me on the market, right? And that's how, like I said, I ended up with a Draco. So um, there's, you know, all in my memory fields too, like I'm going to be, I've said this on other interviews, I'll keep saying it, that my memories are going to keep unfolding over the rest of my life. There's so much to it. I mean, for as much as I know, there's a lot that I don't know. And um, they come in in waves and fits and starts, the memory fields, like it, there's peaks and valleys, like the times when I'm like gathering more information, that's just kind of coming naturally and times when it's very dry and I'm kind of pushed. Uh, sometimes I can just go through times where I do not want to deal with this anymore. I think other people can relate to that. It gets to be a lot. Um, so All right. uh, I think that might be bringing us toward the, toward the close for the well, day. Hold on, hold on. Yeah. Hold on. What else? What else? James? <laughs> were you in a feminine looking body or are you all hulked out in this cybernetic body? No, I had, you know, and this is a great question too. Or you're a like, male body. I was in a, I was in a feminized, I mean, as a female body, but, but I've wondered this too, like at what point, because we would say, don't you want a soldier to be like super strong and buff like a guy? But, but I think because I was a psychic operative, 
you know, they kept me in the female form to, to whatever, you know, I think it's, it's easier to not augment so much that you have to create another gender. Right. So it, there was a, there's more of a, a feminine aspect to that. And I think they wanted aspects of the, the female side for did, certain reasons. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you speak German or English during this time? No, I was English. So it was with Defense Force. I never related with Germans. No, there was and no the, Germans so, there. So it was it mostly Americans on this? Yeah, this it group? was Americans, like corporate. Uh, yeah, ICC. All of that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, did you? Did you? Did they actually put you? Uh, take you to the moon first before they took you to Mars? No, it was a little bit. It was a little bit odd, and I think in this case, because I think that's more the protocol. But maybe because I'd already been on the moon for everything, they had a different. They tracked me a little differently with Dean, and it seemed like we were just sent from from the Great Lakes station to Mars. Yeah, okay. it's it's possible, but I don't. I don't have recall of that. Did Did they have a lot of drugs and painkillers available for free just to kill the boredom? Oh, they had a lot of drugs. Yeah, they had a lot of drugs. They had a lot of drugs. I mean, the drug pharmacopoeia there was extravagant. I mean, it was, and, and it was, I think it, like what you said, like, <clears throat> what are, you know, what do you need here? Um, it was, yeah, that's a really interesting, interesting point that you made. And there was, there was times of kind of boredom, even of like, and I think that's when I had time to think about like, when am I going to get out of this? Is this, is this happening to me? Is this my life? And I'm going to get, is, is there an end to this? And there's a psychological sort of torment that goes with that of thinking like, I don't, I don't really, you know, I came in as an indentured, you know, slave in a way. And at nine years old, you're not asking questions. Nobody's telling you what's going to happen to you or what your future is here. I know I felt like nobody ever informed me. So you have this sort of background noise in the mind, like, what's going to happen to me? Is this it? Is this going to be the rest of my life? And where, where do they promise you uh, money for your time? They, they promised me nothing. I know that this is a story with other people, but I don't remember that conversation at all. Yeah. 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 Maybe not, maybe not a willing slave, but a brainwashed brainwashed um, slave. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So I don't, I don't, I don't remember the, the trickery around that, like making false promises and things like that. Um, so, yeah. so you you say your job was like a psionic ability. So what you were embedded with other groups of super soldiers, the, what see it's like a seer. Yeah. That- I would say a seer like Dean and I together had this, this capacity to have a little more sight than the others. And that's, that was like more of our function and not always, you know, remember being there a long time the, the function would change. And, and, and with Dean, I would, you know, I have to say, the the twinning program made made its 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 um, predictable end and that you know he was forced to kill me in the end so um our 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 end as psychic twins you know came um he was framed for my murder on mars and incarcerated so oh. that they flipped his they flipped his you know they flipped his kill command altar on neil and he killed me at point blank range and that's i think that's part of why it's it's such a it's kind of a mind fuck to kind of go into psychically relating him with, with him now, not because I'm angry with him, but just because he has so much pain around that, like around oh, wow. that. If you look in the, the programming from the Illuminati, it's always that the twins will, you know, one of them is going to, in the end, be forced to kill the other. That is part of the program. Go back to Nazi Germany. You will, you know, you can also probably see find that. that. Star Wars. Uh, yeah. That you always have to kill the Sith Lord in order to take over, but, uh, Right. Yeah. So it's, there's, there's a lot to the twinning and I've done programs just, you know, interviews just on the, the twinning thing, but um, I, you know, I've got, I've got my own healing work to do around all of that with Dean. But I think just to say again, that, that, that our function, you know, changed over time because I was there for so long. Great. Yeah. So go tell, tell everybody what your website is and uh, yeah, how they can contact you. Yeah. Rebecca Rose Barfoot.com. It's in the, I'm sure it's in the description below. I also, I left, I'm a Facebook dropout. And so I have a telegram channel that's growing. You can find me also in the link there and a YouTube channel where um, I have a series called the bringing, bringing light to the darkness series, where I really go deep into um, everything we've talked about here and more. You can check that out also in the link below. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca, for coming on here today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, audience members. That's some great questions, but you know, unfortunately, we're getting tired here. It's a long day. For <laughs> it's getting us. late. Yeah. yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Um, James and I have not done an interview since August 2020. Hopefully, we will do another one before another two or three years goes by. <laughs> but it's a pleasure to be with everybody. Thank you so much.
Yeah, thank you. And uh, visit my website, supersoldertalk.com to learn more. Um, be sure to subscribe to preferably my channel over on Rumble. I don't know. I mean, we're on, I'm on YouTube right now, but this channel is like, yeah, yeah. I'm going to keep posting here for now. But anyhow, uh, also visit my website, neologicaltech.com. I have meditation cubes on there to help you relax. And um, I also have my book on there, Lone Wolf. Uh, yeah, so it goes into my, some of my own experiences. And um, go check out that. There's some list of some conferences I'm going to. There's a conference coming up next week in Sedona. Uh, love if you live out in Arizona or in the area, you don't want to head on out. It's only like $70, I think, for the weekend for that conference. But um, also come out to the one out in Grafton, Illinois. That one's in uh, April. But uh, anyhow, so we'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you all, everybody. And um, yeah, you can, if you want, Rebecca, you can stay on just a moment. I want to hit the, the conclusion okay. here. We'll see y'all later. Please consider supporting Super Soldier Talk by purchasing your own Neo Meditation device. Your Neo Meditation device will help you reduce stress, integrate trauma, enhance intuition, enhance clairvoyance, and enhance creativity. Get yours now at www.neologicaltech.com.